Welcome back to the Path of Passion podcast. I am once again your host, Jason Holland, and this week we're going to be getting just a little bit political. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, voting because of the recent election. We're going to be talking about voting, political participation, uh, the importance of being an informed voter, um, as well as the importance of just being an informed ed- individual overall. But first, like always, we did in the first two episodes, going to get into our movie recommendation for the week. So the first week, I gave y'all horror movies. Uh, second week, I gave y'all a TV show, which was kind of action, and a movie that was kind of action heist. Uh, this one, we're going to switch it up pretty drastically. This one is a musical, as well as... Couldn't really classify it as a rom-com because it's not really uh, a comedy, but more of a romance movie in general. And that is one of my favorite movies of all time, La La Land. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Damien Chazelle, I believe, is the director. Um, Pretty sure he's the director. Absolutely nails it. Uh, Emma Stone, Ryan Gosling, uh, absolutely amazing in it. John Legend's in it. His voice is absolutely phenomenal. As always, the story is just it's such a good movie. I can't get over it. It's, it's one of my comfort movies, honestly. Um, it's one of those movies that most people, whenever they talk to me or I talk to them and they ask for my favorite movie or my favorite movies, uh, they don't really see me saying this. It's one of my favorite movies. But plot basically follows two characters, their lives uh, eventually intersect, and it just follows them. has to do with music, specifically jazz music. It's a musical. The musical numbers are all phenomenal. Also, who can forget the legendary piano theme of this movie? It's called Me and Sebastian's Theme. Look it up if you have never listened to it. I bet you've heard it at some point, uh, but... Honestly, one of my favorite film like film tracks of all time. So good, so relaxing, so amazing. Movie is phenomenal, though. It's one of those movies that you either absolutely love or you absolutely hate it. I've never really met anybody who has a middle ground with this movie. Uh, of course, I am on the I love it side. Uh, but you may be on the I hate it side, but I recommend giving it a chance. It is a little bit of a longer movie. I believe around the three hour mark, I believe it's like two hours and 40 minutes, somewhere around there. Definitely give it a watch, though. Not sure the streaming service. Uh, I know for a fact, of course, you can get it on Amazon Prime like all of these. You can just rent it. Uh, not sure on an actual streaming service you can watch it on, but find it. Definitely watch it. Highly recommend La La Land. All right, now we're going to actually be getting into the topic of today's episode, which, like I mentioned, is uh, politics. We're going to be getting a little political, but not in the aspect that you're thinking. Uh, we're going to keep it pretty neutral or moderate right here. Just going to be talking about the importance of voting, uh, being an informed voter, informing yourself over the issues, uh, and just political participation in general. So the reason this idea was sparked in my head to do this episode is because, again, talking from my generation, talking from my generation to my generation, uh, we have an issue with uh, political participation. Let me just read you a statistic real quick. So according to the U.S. Census Bureau, um, in 2020, so the 2020 election, there was 66.8% voter turnout. That number seems pretty low, wouldn't you say? Like, it seems like more people would want to vote, and it seems like this should be a down year for the United States. However, if I am remembering correctly, that was the record-breaking year for votes. Both candidates, Joe Biden and and Donald Trump, they both got record-setting amount of votes. So Joe Biden won, obviously he's the current president of the United States and he set the record for the most votes. And then Donald Trump set the record for the second most votes and he lost. Like it's crazy to think that a peak participation year in voting is only sitting at 66.8%. Now that number, while like I mentioned is low, it's even worse for our age group. So if you look at this number, um, 66.8%, this is everybody um, who is re- who can vote uh, 18 plus years old. But if you look at my age group specifically, or our age group, Gen Z, less than 50% of our generation or 18 to 24 year olds voted 
in that election. That is absolutely insane to me. The number is specifically at 48%. Uh, once again, that can be found through the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, but that's absolutely crazy to me, especially as a generation, you see all of our advocating, you see our political participation and how much we talk about, well, we want to get involved in politics, how much we talk about, well, political participation is important. Our voice matters. We don't show it when it actually counts at the polls. Um, and I want to be talking about why that is and uh, what are some things we can do to change that, especially since I see that being an issue, because I remember as soon as I turned 18, I was pumped to vote. I remember as soon as I went and renewed my license, uh, they were like, hey, do you want us to go ahead and register you to vote? And I was like, let's go register me to vote. I cannot wait to finally participate in our amazing governmental system. And you would think that's what it is for everybody else. Um, I remember growing up, the different stepping stones in age were you wanted to hit 13 because you were a teenager. Then you wanted to hit 15 so you could get your permit to drive. Then you wanted to hit 16 so that you could actually legally drive. And then you wanted to hit 18 so you could vote. Why do we not actually vote, though? I think a common reason that people tend not to vote, uh, specifically talking uh, to people and seeing um, some discussion online and seeing some discussion on social media is because there's the there's the common statement that our vote doesn't actually matter. Our voice doesn't actually matter. And while I see where that's coming from with the overwhelming numbers, uh, specifically looking at the presidential election is where most people say because they're like, well, the popular vote doesn't always win the presidency. It's true because we have the Electoral College, so you vote within your state, um, and all those votes are tallied up within the state, and um, whichever presidential candidate wins that state, they get the Electoral College votes. And then that goes towards the winner. That's why uh, the entire population, so like popular vote doesn't matter as much as the Electoral vote. Uh, but I see where that's coming from within the presidential election, but... Why do we still not vote during midterms and during our actual state elections and local elections when our voice actually does make a difference? Your vote actually matters. So I wanted to talk about this specifically um, and hit on the your vote actually does matter because of that misconception. I believe that is a big misconception within our generation when discussing voting. So take, for example, the election that as of the day of recording, I am recording the day after election day. Um, so take, for example, this last election. So yesterday, your vote actually matters because the way state elections work and the way um, electing your state officials works, it's not electoral college. It is actually you directly voting on who represents you and directly voting on uh, specifically within Missouri, thinking of Missouri specifically, like amendments that were put on the ballot. This was written within the 17th Amendment of the United States Constitution. You directly vote on your senators. Your voice actually does matter and some other issues. So we had, I believe there were four amendments or four for direct voting uh, issues within Missouri. And those are things that we can actually change through our vote. Now, I'm not going to get into what they were or how I voted or how I think you should vote. These are things that we actually have the power to change. And that's why it's important that we actually vote. So now that we've established that your voice actually does matter whenever it comes to voting um, and why it's important that you actually turn out to vote, I think it's important to discuss how you can register to vote. So you're 18 years or older and you decided you turned 18 or you're older than that and you want to participate within the United States and our wonderful governmental body and system. Oh, you're wondering, how do I do that? I'm going to tell you right now. So Great resource for this uh, before I get into it. So if you just look up vote.org, so V-O-T-E dot org, O-R-G, um, it brings you to the website. And actually, it's a pretty great resource, at least from the way I was looking through it, um, showing you how to vote, why it's important to vote. Um, they have a shop, which 
I think is a topic on its own thing. I think it's a little um, – I don't like it. Uh, I get it. They have to support themselves somehow. But I'm not a big fan of like monetizing, just telling people to vote. I, I don't know. That's a whole issue for me. Also, USA.gov. Um, is another great source for that. Um, you can just look up how do I register to vote, and one of the first um, resources or one of the first steps um, or sites, searches, whatever you want to call them, uh, is from USA.gov. And basically, here are the steps if you want to vote. So first, you have to register to vote. Um, USA.gov shows you where to do that. They give you the resources to find how to do that. And I think it's a great first step. So you just go to USA.gov and we'll ask you a few questions after you click on the first thing that just says, oh, I want to register to vote. It'll take you through that whole process. Super handy, super amazing. And that's pretty much first step on how to find out to register to vote. I know personally, I don't know if this is how it works everywhere, um, but whenever I renewed my license, like I mentioned earlier, I just went down to the DMV and they basically said, hey, do you want to go ahead and register to vote? Um, I said, yeah. I also had to register for the draft, but they were like, hey, do you want to go ahead and register to vote? I said, yes, let's do it. So they may ask you that question. You could go down to your local like county office um, you could go down to your like local office. You could go um, DMV. Some sort of governmental body should have information um, on how you can vote. So next thing you do is you want to learn when's voting day and where's the location? Where do I actually go to vote and on what day do I actually go and vote. So speaking specifically in terms of the general election, uh, basically what the government says, basically how it's written out, is that the election is held on the first Tuesday uh, following the first Monday of November. So basically it's the first Tuesday of November, typically. Um, so it can fall anywhere between... November 2nd and November 8th, it's going to fall somewhere between those days, just depending on the year. Um, and that's when the general election will be. The primaries, um, I can't remember specifically, and that's on me, but primaries are normally before that, a few months before that. But basically what you're going to do is once you find out when it is, you're going to have to find out where you actually go and vote. And this is by a county-by-county county basis. But basically, you're going to go down there, uh, you're going to find out where it is, and they're going to walk you through the process, and you basically just go vote there during election day. I believe that the polls close at 6 or 7 um, your time, so it'll be 6 or 7 your time. Um, but yeah, you're just going to go down there and vote. But after you've gone and um, figured out where you're actually going to vote and what day you're actually going to vote on, um, it's time. Go vote. Put something in your calendar. Schedule out time during that day if you got to work, if you like if you work or if you're going to be someone. Figure out a time to actually go and vote. I think that's the biggest issue is people get so passionate about voting, but they don't actually give themselves time to. So uh, it comes to election day, they're super pumped, and then they realize they're busy and they can't go do it. And they're like, oh, well, what's one vote going to matter? Go and vote. Like that one vote can't actually statistically matter. So go and vote. There are also some like ways that you can vote if you like actually can't go and vote in that physical location. So I know for me, I'm still registered to vote in my home county, but I am four hours away from that. I can't drive there in the middle of a school day uh, to go and vote. So I got an absentee ballot. Uh, there's different ways you can actually go about doing it. Absentee is the most popular. Um, if you want to figure out how to get an absentee ballot, just basically Google how to get an absentee ballot in in blank, insert your state right there, and it will tell you how to do it. Super simple process. Uh, that's a way you can also vote if you physically can't go to the voting booth. And then, like I said, if you need any more information, if you need any other like information on how to vote, um, just voting in general and how the process works, uh, vote.org, so that's V-O-T-E dot O-R-G, vote.org, is an amazing place to go for that information. Also, like I said, USA.gov also has a lot of information for you to learn how to vote um, and actually learning how to go through the process. Now, before you vote, before you actually go to the booth, before you actually go there, it's important that you know what you're voting on. Um, 
I think a video that really highlighted this that I actually just recently watched, I found it earlier today, or I found it last night and I ended up watching it today. Um, Jubilee is a YouTube channel. They do a lot of videos where it's like um, blank or like X group and Y group discuss. It's called, um, I believe it's called Middle Ground, something like that. Um, they do videos like that and I think it's really interesting. And the video that I saw was um, conservative versus liberal versus moderate teenagers. And it basically says, can they find middle ground? What do they all agree on? We're just going to discuss topics from those points of views. And I found it to be really interesting because it highlights the minority of people that actually have information on what topics are being voted on, who they're voting on, what they actually stand for. And while I think it's really important to put that out there to show that there is actual political participation uh, within our generation and to show that there are actually people that care, it's also kind of scary because a lot of people see that and they're like, oh, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Like, we don't have to worry about informing the youth because obviously they're informed. That is definitely not the case, and that's not even just for my generation. That is for every generation. Let me give you a little bit of a um, reason or a good look at to, as to why you should be informed whenever you decide you want to go vote. So it's election day, and you roll down to the booth, and you get the ballot. You see the candidates, so I'm going to use this here for an example. So you're voting on a senator, you're voting on a um, audit, state auditor, and you're voting on a few local people and a few people representing your county within your state. This ballot tells you no information whatsoever about these people. The only thing that it tells you on the ballot about these people, what party they're from, and their first and last name. That is literally the only thing it tells you about these people. Now I ask you, why is this a dangerous thing for you to go in blinds? Obviously, because if I go in there, I don't know who I'm voting for. I'm going to pick a random name without any implications. You could be the most peace-loving, compassionate person ever. And you could have no idea what you're voting on and you could accidentally vote for a person who with completely opposite beliefs of you. You could vote for somebody who is very uh, bigoted, who is very misogynistic, racist, insert whatever you want right there. You could accidentally vote for them because you are not informed. That is a big, big deal because if everybody thought the same as you and everybody picked that person, well, then that person is elected to office. That is very scary. Now, I'm not saying this actually happens because um, a lot of people do at least have some sort of idea on who they're voting on, uh, but I don't think it's completely informed information. A lot of it is just done through campaign ads, attack ads, um, and basically just ads saying, this person believes in this because they um, obscurely did this this one time 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago. And a lot of people form their opinions off that. Well, I think that's a... Not decent. Well, I think it's a beginning way to start to form your opinions on people. It's not the final step. It should be the first stepping stone and then you go from there. It's also important that you're informed on who you're voting on in these topics. Now, I will say the actual like ballot issues are completely different. Um, they show you a little bit of information. They basically highlight exactly what it's going to do. Uh, they highlight basically how the law is going to change. And they, um, at least this year, uh, this is the first time I got to vote this year. Um, they put in there, basically said, hey, this is what the state like professional or like professionals that we inquired with basically say how this is going to affect the budget and the taxes. Uh, it gives you a little bit more information, but I think it's still also important that you actually go in with information on your own because some things could say, oh, this is really good. This is really good. It's going to make us a lot of money or potentially make us a lot of money. But it could be something that goes against your beliefs and you don't know it. Or it could be something just the way they're phrasing it. And if you actually look at it, it's a completely different thing. That's why it's still important to research those issues as well. Specifically going back to candidates, though, I think a lot of people run into that issue where they identify specifically with a political party and only vote for those people based on their political party and their political affiliation. I'm personally of the belief that I think we should get rid of party 
like affiliations on the ballots because I think it'd be interesting to make people actually research what they're talking about because most of the time people now political parties have their purpose um, they have their reasoning for existing and they have some benefits uh, but one of the negative things is people identify solely with a political party and don't actually um, vote for issues because they've researched them because they personally believe in it um, they vote for the issues they vote for the people because of their political affiliations and I think that's really dangerous because political parties are changing all the time they change every four years um, each new presidential election cycle both um, both parties like, I'm thinking mainly Republican and Democrat, but of course there's libertarians, there's constitutionalists, there's socialists, there's there's all of them. Uh, but mainly like Republican and Democrat get together with their convention and um, basically say, hey, this is what our platform is going to be. Um, this is what we're going to vote on and this is what our ideals are on this. Sound good? Okay, great. Break. Um, so those are changing every four years and if you strictly identify with a party, your opinions are changing every four years. Um, it's kind of crazy and you're really not controlling what those opinions are. So I just ranted about like why it's important that you research them but talking about how to actually research them. So basically an idea that I was presented with which I really like and I've – briefly use this and I think it's a good way I'm going to start implementing this more is you get a list like in an Excel sheet. You do an Excel sheet and list every single candidate off on the left and then across the top you have your five to ten, preferably five key main beliefs that you have and you write those up there, whether it be education, whether it be like um, taxes, whether it be anything, you put those five main things up top. Basically what you do is go down the list. So let's say the first one is education. Um, I am strong on that our education needs to be X, Y, Z. And you go through the candidates and basically on a point system from one to five rate them on how they stand on that topic. Five being they agree with you wholeheartedly, like everything, every single thing they say, like 95% of what they say about that topic is 100% what you agree with. And one being they literally are complete opposite of you or 95% complete opposite of you. And you go down and do that. And by the end of it, you should have a point total for all of them. So you go through, let's say, uh, candidate one, I give them a one on this, a five on this, a four on this, uh, two on this and a three on this. And um, then candidate two, like, let's say five, one, one, two, one. If you total those up, candidate A or one, I can't remember what I said. Candidate A agrees with you on more things. So therefore you should vote on that person. That person is best going to represent you. And you can do this with every single candidate from a local level all the way to a national level. Um, and it's really important that you actually do this because you're actually voting on the person that specifically represents you. You're also going to learn a lot about the issues that are on hand. You could completely change your mind on an issue just by researching it. And doing this is as simple as going to Google and basically saying, I'm going to use our governor, for example, Mike Parson, basically going to Google and saying, Mike Parson on agriculture. Mike Parsons' stance on education. Mike Parsons' stance on taxation. And you basically just Google that, go through, watch a few videos that they've talked about it, uh, read a few quotes, read a few like interviews that they've had on it, um, and basically gather your information from that. Uh, it's as simple as doing that, doing your slight research on that. That will make you 100% more of an informed voter going into the booth, and you're going to actually have your own opinions, and you're actually going to go in knowing exactly what you want, and you're harder to sway in a mindless direction one way or the other. But let's talk about specifically why. I have a few key reasons on why um, it's important to be an informed voter. So the first one I talked about is like, you can't easily be tricked or manipulated. So if you've actually gone through and researched, let's say candidate A, uh, you gone through research and you find that like, they rate pretty highly on your point system and um, you plan on voting for them because you know their true stance on these things. But you see like, let's say an attack ad on candidate A and it talks about, they actually don't believe in this. But because you've done your research, you know that they actually do 
they've spoke on it numerous times. And actually, the information that they're using in this attack ad was um, taken out of context and actually had nothing to do with this and blah, 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 taken out of context. It makes you harder to manipulate because you actually have those solidified reasonings in your head as to why you're voting on this person. Um, it makes it harder for them to pull you one way or another, um, and it makes you a lot more of a solidified, true like thinker and a true um, individual having your own opinions and having your own uh, beliefs. Um, the second reason is it's because you can discuss realistic solutions for the issues. If you're actually informed on what these issues are, because like I said, going through the candidates, um, you're actually going to find the information on these candidates, you're actually going to find out why you uh, agree with them based on your key issues. And you're going to learn a lot about these issues going through there. You're going to learn a lot about what they've said, their research um, that they're citing. You can go back through, look at that research, form your own opinions on it. You start to get your own opinions on things. You start to form your own solutions for things. And you can start to have um, more intellectual conversations with people uh, because as much as we want to avoid politics, as much as we talk about, oh, politics, I don't want to get involved in that because it's like this, bad, like blah, blah, blah. It's going to be brought up. Uh, being informed on politics is super important because it is an everyday part of your life. Whether or not you want it to be or not, everything um, tends to have some sort of political element to it. Everything from the speed limit and the laws that you abide by every single day to like the actual like uh, big ticket issues um, that people are fighting on a national stage. Uh, everything has its own political like background in some way. Politics are going to get brought up. Uh, and that's also part of being an adult and a part of growing up um, is you're going to have to learn to talk politics because like I said, that's something that happens in our everyday lives. And th this is kind of a side note on this. I think the reason that it became taboo is because people um, started having like negative discourse on it. People started just yelling. It turned into an arguing match. And the people that enjoy that continue to do that. But the people who don't enjoy that much confrontation and don't enjoy getting yelled at kind of back down. And anytime somebody brings up politics, they immediately associate it with that in their mind. And they're like, I don't want to talk politics. But you're able to um, have an informed opinion on issues being brought up. So let's say you're in a friend circle. Um, let's say you're at a dinner party, you're in a friend circle, and they're all talking about um, the recent candidate and the recent thing that got brought up or a recent local issue. Because you've done your research, you can confidently talk about that. You don't have to sit off in the corner and not be engaged in the conversation. You can confidently talk about it and have a respectful discourse with these people because you know what you're talking about. But then again, not everybody's perfect on this, and I want to preface this as like, you can be as informed as, possi as possible – but you're still not perfect. You still don't know every single thing about it. There's still more that you can learn, and it's important to be a good listener during those conversations because they may bring up a different idea that you never thought of before and that you think is a good point, and you want to continue to listen to that. Um, and the third reason why it's important for you to be an informed voter is because it makes you a more interesting person. Who doesn't want to be a more interesting person? A few of the reasons that it makes you a more interesting person is, uh, one, because you have your own opinions, you have your own um, way about you, um, you have your own thoughts about you, and you don't, you don't blend into a crowd as easily. You have your own opinions, you have your own mix of opinions, and... Um, it just makes you more interesting that way. Also, like I mentioned, you can have deeper discussions with people. You can talk about those hard-hitting issues. Um, it makes you more intelligent overall. You are smarter on these issues. You're smarter on current topics, actual issues affecting your everyday life. You become more intelligent. You learn to read um, graphs. You learn to analyze statistics correctly. You learn what source can be trusted over another. You start to become more intelligent. And finally, it helps you think clearer. You can see through the stuff that people throw at you, the negative stuff that people throw at you, the negative or misinformed comments that people throw at you and act like they're actually a true informed comment on that. And you can actually see through that and say, you know what? Well, I want to respect your opinion. Unfortunately, that 
isn't informed. You're just saying stuff because you want to say stuff. Now, this actually gets into a perfect transition into our next thing, which is it is important to have respectful discussions even through those situations. This goes into everything with politics. This is the reason, like I mentioned, that I believe it's starting to become more and more taboo is because people see the negative side of it. People see the videos of uh, left-wing people and right-wing people on TikTok and on YouTube um, just yelling at people, berating them, and it's like, ooh, like uh, Republican roasted, ooh, liberal roasted, oh, this person roasted. And they see that and they see it as negative, which it 100% should be seen as negative. It's not a good way to have discourse. Uh, now, you could absolutely like, roast somebody and absolutely disprove their opinion, but you don't need to say, ooh, roasted, look, they're stupid, they're uninformed. No, um, you, you have these conversations, you have these discussions, you have these debates to have a more informed public, to have more informed opinions, uh, potentially uh, shift your views and potentially shift their views um, and actually have these important discussions so that we're all more informed. So there's two key ways I describe this. You want to have empathetic discussions and you want to have, dis you want to have productive discussions. Um, I'm going to start with the latter first. So with productive, you want to have discussions that are productive. It's not productive to actually go out there and yell at people. Uh, people are more likely to, and again, if I can find the statistic, I'll throw it down there. Um, I hate throwing out statistics that I don't immediately have sources for. So I apologize for that. Um, I'll do my best to find those. But um, people, the more you throw facts at them and just berate them with statistic after statistic after statistic after statistic, they're less likely to change their minds, which seems completely counterintuitive. And I agree, but it's human nature because we don't want to just be told we're wrong, 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 wrong. We want to have a personal connection with somebody. We want to know that they see us as a human and we want to know that they respect what we're saying, but disagree. So respectfully disagree with what we're saying. And then we're more open to actually changing our minds. Um, it kind of gets into the uh, empathetic side of things. Uh, empathy is a big word for me. I think it's really important to be empathetic. And it goes into people are more likely to change their minds and we're more likely to uh, change our minds and be more informed when you actually see it from another person's point of view. So having these empathetic discussions go somewhere along these lines. And um, it, it comes more from a place of understanding and getting to the root reason why people actually believe these things. An empathetic version of this conversation, and it plays into the whole uh, productive uh, discourse, productive conversations, because this is how a situation like that would go. Let's say somebody says, I believe this, and you don't agree with it. The first thing you should do and from personal experience this comes and from seeing other experiences and seeing other discourse, the first thing you should do instead of saying, actually, you're wrong because X, Y, Z, you should say, oh, really, why do you believe that? Well, I believe this because uh, this happened to me and I've seen this within my life and I've uh, looked at these numbers, but actually it really because it affected my family when I was this year's old and I've had a bad experience with uh, the other side. Okay, um, could you elaborate a little more on that bad experience if you feel comfortable? Well, whenever I was this age, uh, this happened to me, this happened to my family, um, X, Y, Z, we got hurt by it, uh, we saw negative things, had a bad interaction with this person you start to understand why they actually believe the way they do. And then you can work towards common ground. You start to understand that their belief in this isn't viewed in a disdain for your side, uh, but rather viewed in a personal way, in a personable, in a humane way. They have this belief because of a personal experience. And they also Hopefully, they have statistics to back it up. They have all these numbers to back it up. You can get numbers to back up anything, essentially. That's just throwing that out there. You can get statistics to back up pretty much any idea that you want. But they have this belief, and you're like, okay, I understand where you're coming from. It's putting yourself in, those shoe in their shoes. If uh, you went through that situation, would you believe that same thing? Probably. Putting yourselves in their shoes and saying, okay... 
So I understand where you're coming from. Um, this is why I believe the way I do. And then you explain the reason you believe the way you do. You don't just want to make it a one-sided, like, I'm attacking you, just trying to figure out all this stuff. Talk about why you believe it the way you do. And then you form that human connection, that human bond right there that allows you to have a productive discourse that's very respectful because you've humanized each other and you understand where each other's coming from. You may not change their mind. They may not change your mind, but you have a common respect because you know that they have a reasoning for their beliefs and they know you have a reasoning for your beliefs. That's very, very, very important in our society. And that's one of the basis of political discourse. So I'm going to play a video for you guys in a second. We just talked about why it's important to be empathetic, why it's important to uh, have productive conversations. Um, and I'm going to play a video for you guys here in a second. Um, and don't worry, audio listeners, if you're listening on a podcast, you can, it, the voice is what actually matters. The audio is what actually matters. So it's a, a Senate, senatorial debate. And the two candidates were asked a question. And basically the question went like, hey, everybody's tired of attack ads. I want you to say something admirable about your opponent. And I want you to just listen to how this goes down. So our final question here tonight is, both of you have been successful in life. You have 30 seconds here. Mr. Barnes, you go first. What do you find admirable about your opponent? Well, no, no, seriously, I, I do think, you know, the senator has proven to be a family man, and I think that's, that's admirable. Um, you know, that's absolutely to be respected. He, he speaks about his family. He's uh, done a lot to provide for them. I absolutely respect that. Mr. Johnson. I mean, likewise, I appreciate the fact that uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes had loving parents, a school teacher, father worked third shift, so he had a you know, good upbringing. I guess what puzzles me about that is with that upbringing, why is he turned against America? I mean, what, why, why does he find the right. founding of America awful? Right. It's, it's, it's Somehow, we, it puzzles we me. did not. I said, we argue. said something admirable. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why there's such an issue with political discourse and political division within the United States right now. The first candidate immediately jumped in, immediately had something. He was like, you know what? I'm serious about this. I, I, th I think the senator's proven to be a family man, and I really respect that because family is really important. And the second candidate basically says, well, yeah, yeah, likewise, because I think he just didn't really want to come up with something about his opponent, which is red flag number one. And then after being told to just say something kind to somebody, has to turn it into an attack on this person and that... It's one of the most saddening and angering things to me because why is it so hard for us as humans to just be nice to each other, specifically within political discourse? Like I said, having true discussions goes in with it first humanizing the person. And I'll be 100% honest, I saw that video, haven't seen any of the rest of the debate, haven't seen any of the other contexts. That's just the context that I have. I don't know how the candidate A actually believes how he actually is or uh, candidate B, I don't know how he actually is or what he actually believes. Uh, but just based on that video, it tells a lot about their character. And I think that's a big problem. And like I mentioned, being empathetic is one of the first, being empathetic, compassionate, um, humanizing the other person in the discussion is one of the biggest, biggest things because it leads us to actual common ground. We're actually able to have true discussions and true political discourse with people. And that's what I want you to take away right now is, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, it does not matter what your political opinions are. I, unless you are blatantly being bigoted, unless you're blatantly being like racist towards somebody, uh, misogynistic towards someone, like unless you were flat out saying, I hate this person because of an uncontrollable aspect of their life, I couldn't care less what your political opinions are. As long as you have a reasoning behind it, I can respect it. As long as that reasoning is logical, like I'm not any of the other things, as long as your reasoning is logical, I can respect it. Just be kind to people. Just show empathy. Just show compassion towards people. Just have discussions that you can come out of the discussion even without your mind changed one bit, you even just solidified your opinion. But still having respect for the person on the other side of the discussion, debate, 
argument, whatever you want to call it. Because in the end of the day, we are all here for one common purpose, and that's to do what we believe is best for our life and the life of the people around us.